first reading is Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with flute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with clanging cymbals. Praise Him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. <laughs> the second lesson comes from Acts 5, 27-32. When they had brought him, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel reading. Uh, part of it is a tradition 
tradition of the church to celebrate um, what we call Holy Hilarity Sunday, or sometimes it's called Holy, Holy Humor Sunday, or uh, some churches celebrate Bright uh, Sunday, is what it's called, the Sunday after Easter. I'm not going to tell you any jokes, I couldn't find any clean ones to tell you this morning, but I'll leave that up to you. Maybe you want to share a joke with your neighbor uh, before you leave today, and that would be great because it's, uh, it's certainly appropriate that, uh, that we can laugh uh, together. And this goes way back, we'll talk a little bit about the history of that, I'll try to teach you a little bit about the history of Holy Larry Sunday or uh, Holy Humor uh, Sunday. You know, as a congregation, I think that's something that we... Uh, certainly desire uh, to do together, that we might uh, delight uh, together to walk with each other as a community, as uh, not only a family of, of faith, uh, but certainly a family of disciples of Jesus, that we walk with each other, that we hold each other's hand, uh, particularly when life becomes hard for us. And, uh, and so we, we help each other. And I know as I look out at the congregation, uh, many of you have held somebody else's hand in a very difficult time in their lives. And, and, and so you are a disciple of Jesus when, when you do that, because that's what we're called to do. We're called to share in other people's uh, tragedies and hardships and grief and despair. And, and we walk, we walk together. That's uh, simply what, uh, you know, we, we gather uh, with an expression of the church, meaning the local congregations. We also gather uh, as a synod, and that's all the Lutheran congregations in our area. We call that a synod. Um, and all those churches together, simply what synod means is walking together. So, so we do that to, to help each other. And so when it comes my turn uh, to go through a hard and difficult time in my life, um, I hope to have somebody walking along uh, the side of me as, as well. But we do that through difficult times, and certainly we delight in that because we become better people. Um, but also, we're, we're called to laugh with each other as well. We're called uh, to uh, we're, we're called uh, to celebrate together as a community of faith as well, and that's just as important, I believe. And just a little history of this, uh, um, St. Francis of Assisi, and, and some of you uh, remember him, and maybe you've even uh, read some things about him, but this goes way back to the 1200s. He was under fire because of, he was criticized because of an unusual rule of silence that he uh, promoted at his monastery. Now, monasteries, of course, are known for uh, times of silence when they have periods where you do not talk, right? It's, it's silent time where you meditated. On my sabbatical now, a few years ago, I went to St. John's Abbey, and uh, they practiced that. Um, they practiced that in Collegeville, uh, that time of silence. So when I was there, I think I was there for almost a week, five days, sit down and gather with other people for a meal, but we would never say a word to each other. You would, you would not speak to each other in that, that I mean, can you imagine that having a meal together and not say, well, we do that with our kids all the time, I guess, so it's not a big deal, but, but it is awkward not to say but that that practice of having that silent meditation was common in the monasteries in St. Francis's time, and still is common today, but St. Francis allowed um, in this time of silence uh, for people in his monastery to share his laughter that they were allowed to laugh together in their time of silence, and, and he was criticized for this. And of course, St. Francis was just practicing what you know, a tradition that began in the third and fourth centuries by some of our church fathers, um, St. Augustine and John Christendom, uh, all of those great fathers of our faith, uh, they all had agreed that God played the greatest trick on the devil when God rose Jesus from the dead. That, that this was a great trick, and, and so it became the tradition to speak about this Sunday after Easter as, as Holy Hilarious Sunday or Holy Humor Sunday, because it was important uh, as it is to walk with each other through difficult times. It's as important to be able to laugh with each other. It's important to smile once in a while, all right? Uh, so sometimes uh, we think that we have to be so you know, glum in church that, that we can offer a little a little smirk once in a while, um, you know, I, you know that uh, 
that uh, kind of idea that you can't laugh in church. Many of you probably grew up in, in a congregation where you didn't do that, right? Where, uh, where you were serious when you walked into the sanctuary, that there wasn't laughing, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a sense of joyfulness. But read the Psalms. You know, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. I mean, that needs to be a, a part of our faith, uh, uh, certainly a, a, big part of, a big part of our faith, because God has a cosmically wonderful sense of humor. Um, you know, and I, and I think it might be an uphill battle uh, in some, at least some folks' minds that the idea that the church be a place of joy and laughter, the, the idea that God's marvelous actions in and through and beyond history give us something to be joyful about. I know that's a battle for some people, but, you know, when you think about God's work in Jesus Christ, you can't help but just maybe have a, a big belly laugh, you know, about that, regarding, regarding that. The Church of Jesus Christ is, a, of course, a divine institution. It's a divine institution, but it's an institution also that's been placed in your hands. I mean, God has given you the church to, to care for, and God has given me the church to care for it. And sometimes we do a good job of that, and sometimes we don't do such a good job of, of that. So I, I think that at least the posture of the church needs to be uh, this sense of repentance and, and forgiveness that, that Jesus kind of stretches our minds a bit as we read the Gospel lesson this, this morning. Um, and, and, and I think the, the first step towards being a properly repentant and forgiving church or a properly repentant and forgiving person is, uh, the first step is maybe to learn to not take ourselves so seriously all, all the time. I mean, sometimes I think we need to have a little laughter. I think sometimes we need to have a little joy. Sometimes we need to light up a little bit and not take ourselves so, so seriously. People who can't laugh at themselves are often the very same people who don't know how or when to say, I'm sorry, or please forgive me. So we need to lighten up, we need to learn not to take ourselves so seriously all the time. And let's take today's Gospel lesson as a case in point. When our lesson begins, it is the same day as it was last Sunday. It's just in the evening, right? It was the evening on that first resurrection day. And, and so the friends and the followers of Jesus, the disciples, had just heard the news from Mary Magdalene and Simon Peter. They heard that the Lord is alive. So naturally, what do they do? They lock themselves up in a the room. They close the door, lock it, because they are in fear. So, you know, uh, apparently their logic is the Lord is alive, so let's go hide, right? Let's go hide in fear. That was the logic of the first disciples. And one can only imagine Jesus standing outside that very locked door. Jesus, who was not held at bay by the stone in front of the tomb, a, a massive stone, Jesus is not going to be held at bay by this locked door of the disciples either. And so Jesus, whose body apparently is not entirely subject to the same rules and regulations as our bodies, is, is you know, in, in, that we have to follow, kind of passes through, passes right through those locked doors and stands before those disciples in fear and says to them, Shalom. And breathes on them, John tells us, breathes on them the Holy Spirit. So they're given the Holy Spirit, and they're given this word of peace for their fearful lives. Peace be with you, Jesus says. And, 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 and I think it means something more like, now that I'm here, Jesus is saying, now that I'm in your presence, peace be with you. You don't have to be frightened anymore. My peace will be with you. So then, so then you can just stop hyperventilating, you know, because things are going to be okay. Peace be with you. And then Jesus gives this very uh, uh, scared group of people. Remember all the hiding? Remember all the abandoning that the disciples did? Remember Peter who denied 
Jesus three times. I mean, we follow Jesus through Monday, Thursday, and through Good Friday, right? I mean, these disciples had completely fled. Uh, they, had, they would not want anything. They did not want anything to do with this Jesus when, when he was taken to the cross and crucified. But here, Jesus remains with them and gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit and, and gives them a mission to go out and to, to live a life of forgiveness and a life of repentance. Given this group of people the job of forgiveness to this group of people which has a lot of explaining to you whose members have probably been having nightmares of remorse all weekend long. They're given the amazing responsibility of bringing forgiveness to a world that is racked with anguish and, and guilt. So isn't our God a funny God? I mean, that God would choose this type of people? God certainly is a God that is full of humor, right? But a God that is full of grace as well, because God has chosen you. God has chosen you also. And then there's something else funny about this story. Thomas gets this adjective forever affixed to his name. And we, we know about this. We know what that adjective is, right? When, when, uh, when uh, mothers, uh, soon-to-be mothers, want to pick the name of their child, particularly if they know that that child is going to be a boy, they probably stay away from this name, Thomas. Because we know the adjective. It is, you know it. It's not just Thomas, but it is doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas, so Thomas kind of has that negative connotation to its name, and I, and I think that's unfair. That's unfair because all Thomas wants is what all the other friends of Jesus have been given, and that's a front row seat of the resurrection, right? They, he just wanted to see Jesus resurrected like all the other disciples. To dwell on Thomas as a doubter is, I think, to miss something sweet and subtle going on in, in this part of the story, something that is actually aimed at you something that's aimed at me as, as well. The point is this, for those of us who come later, who come to faith slowly, or who come to faith painfully, or who come to faith with many twists and turns, or with lots of questions that remain unanswered, in Thomas, you see, we have a friend. So we shouldn't call Thomas doubting Thomas, we should call Thomas our friend, Thomas our ally, Thomas. Because in Thomas, we have someone who says, I'm sorry, with astonishing flair. He says, my Lord and my God. In Thomas, we have someone who, like us, gets to say, oops, gets to say, I'm, I'm sorry about that. And then to have our ears turn red when it turns out to be Christ that's standing right in front of us when we didn't know it, when we didn't realize it was Jesus right there. And this is not a metaphor. Jesus with us is not a metaphor. It's just not a way that we talk about the resurrected Jesus. Jesus is really quite clear about this. Because Jesus says, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Every day we have countless opportunities to look Jesus in the eye and then to blush at the fact that we didn't recognize him right away. And then to say, I'm sorry, then to say, my Lord and my God. So let us be glad and let us rejoice once in a while. We follow a risen Lord. You know, we know that there are a lot of children that follow Jesus. You know, and most children... They don't want to hang around people that are stern and kind of glow, right? I mean, we know Jesus was a rejoicing Jesus. So let's give thanks for this Lord that was really, what many people have said, the antidepressant of the Christian church. That Jesus was kind of the Prozac of our religion. You know, we maybe should find a way to put that on a sign outside, outside our church. Because we don't have a faith that's a, a glam and a glow. Right? We have a faith that is rejoicing. So lighten up. Put a little smile on your face once in a while. Don't take yourself so seriously. Let us say and let us rejoice in the Lord always.
Jesus says, Rejoice in me. I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you.